Um, uh, Mr. Byrne, you're recognized. Thank you. Admiral Fowler, good to see you. For some time, you and I have discussed, and we've discussed on this committee, the need to have a naval presence in your AOR. You finally got the USS Detroit. Tell us what impact has come from that. Well, just uh, associate myself with the remarks of uh, General Shaughnessy on, on the importance of ships, Coast Guard assets, U.S. Navy ships. Uh, at the end of the day, we've got to have platforms to do the work, and they they both enable us to do detection and monitoring, to find and, and, and then use law enforcement assets, Coast Guard law enforcement detachments to do the interdiction. It also allows us to train with our partners and to perform a, a variety of missions. In the case of Detroit, the first deployment of littoral combat ship to the region, it performed above all standards, uh, good operational readiness. Uh, we took that ship off the coast of Venezuela. We did a freedom of navigation operation. The ship performed superbly ship was involved in counter-narcotics operations and it was welcome. Uh, and so we'll, we'll see uh, that ship back. And so uh, that presence sends a big statement about U.S. commitment, sends a big statement to our friends, reassures them, and then to our adversaries, uh, that those, and those are capable platforms. Would you like to have more? We have a demand signal that is unmet uh, through the Global Force uh, distribution. I think our Navy would like to have more, and we'd like to have some of that presence in SOUTHCOM. Uh, our fourth fleet, which is uh, the uh, counterpart to second fleet in uh, Norfolk, they focus on building partner capacity, working with our partners and exercises. We've got to have ships to do that, We've got to have assets to do that. And um, I think the littoral combat ship, um, you, you and I have been to sea on one, yeah. they provide uh, the, uh, the, the right kind of platform for this region. Uh, to meet our partners' needs. And the ships, it's, uh, it had some hit, hit problems in the past. It's working those bugs out, and we've been happy with the deployment of the Detroit. Good. Last year, we authorized and appropriated money to convert an expedi expeditionary fast transport to a medical transport. Does this type of capability help with your missions at SOUTHCOM? Uh, it does. We, we have um, one deployed with us now. Uh, we've asked for more. We think we could use it as a platform for, for a range of missions, counter-narcotics mission uh, to put Marines on. Um, the Commandant of the Marine Corps has been very clear. He wants to get the Marine Corps back to sea. This, this platform can hold um, in the neighborhood of hundreds of Marines, and it can be flexible to move around and allow those Marines to engage partner Marines. The United States Marine Corps, like our Navy, are the gold standard. Partners want to train with them and learn from them, and, uh, and then that plays back when our partners uh, need to fight alongside us, as some of them have had to do in past wars. And so we welcome that ship as a, a flexible a platform. Uh, it turns out they're in demand by all the combatant commanders, uh, and we are making a case for why a couple more working in tandem with perhaps littoral combat ship as a, a floating logistics base in addition to working with Marines. You know, the fast speed, shallow draft, there's, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in those platforms, and we've asked for those, as well as we've asked for the uh, acceleration of the expeditionary staging bases, which are built out in, in, uh, in San Diego as a way to, to move Marines around the theater, uh, uh, make a statement of U.S. presence and commitment, and importantly, get our partners engaged in, in the training. Important platforms. Let me shift gears for a minute. Um, what effect has the reduction in foreign assistance to the Northern Triangle had on your ability to work with partners and allies in the region? The, uh, the funding's been and restored, and it's critical in the mill-to-mill -mill, uh, range that, that IMET training, for example, is, is what we'd apply to a country like Honduras. I use those as examples. So while that funding was suspended, and, and, uh, and I agree that the pressure actually worked that we placed, and those nations have stepped up to do more on the migration. So the pressure was good. The, the pause in funding, to me, in a way, demonstrated the commitment of our, our partners on Honduras, transferred money around, and they value our education so much that they paid for it. But something clearly didn't get done uh, as a result of that. So uh, the consistent funding in those realms is important to build their capacity. Uh, again, has to be a return, return on investment shown. We, we can, we've seen that. So there was an impact, but I, I think we're through that now and we're moving ahead. And those nations have stepped up to demonstrate why they – are responsibly using the funds that uh, our taxpayers are, are providing. It's got to have a sh show return on investment. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, Ms. Torres Small, you're recognized. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you all for being here and for your service to our country. 
Uh, General O'Shaughnessy, uh, in the context of a heightened period such as we are in today with the eve of the 2020 elections and the aftermath of the Soleimani strike, can you speak to how NORTHCOM liaises with DHS's cybersecurity and uh, infrastructure security agency, CISA, F the FBI, U.S. Cyber Command, and the National Security Agency to monitor for domestically targeted threats from overseas uh, adversaries such as China and Russia? Yeah, thank you, Ma'am, for uh, allowing me to, to highlight some of the great work that is being done. And there is collaboration here, and that's the exciting part. Uh, literally, from the day that CISA stood up, literally the very day they stood up, we had liaisons embedded within there, and they had liaisons embedded within our uh, command and control uh, organization at NORTHCOM. And so literally from as it was birthed, uh, we were able to be part and connected uh, with uh, CISA. Almost every event that we do, we, we end up there with CISA because you can't separate home and defense and home and security to, to that point. Um, and I, in fact, I meet more with the Secretary uh, of uh, uh, Homeland Security, I think, than, I, than even the Department of Defense because we have such a, a tight relationship uh, there. And what's NORTHCOM's specific role in that partnership? Right. One of the things that we found is it, it is it is a team effort, right? And you mentioned the right uh, players that are part of that. One of the things Northcom has found is we can apply the same model that we've been using for hurricanes and, and applying federal capability to some of the state and local issues. We found that we can actually apply that using that model and taking the expertise, for example, in Cyber Command and applying it through Northcom in a defense support to civil authorities model. So I'll use the elections as an example in the in the, both the 18 and now even in the Super Tuesday we just had. Uh, uh, we actually brought all of the tags in to our headquarters, and we had Paul Nakasoni from Cyber Command there and Joe and Gail there. We provided them information at the highest classification level of what the threats were that were out there. Um, we then gave them some capability and capacity that they could bring back to their states because it's just not fair for a state, like a local state, like um, Colorado is where I live, uh, to be competing with a Russia, as an example. And General, so that brings I promise I'm, I'm not cutting you off because you're from Colorado, but I do want to switch to get to another point quickly. Um, Admiral Fowler, I'm going to switch to you just briefly. I really appreciated my colleague's discussion with you about the Northern Triangle, and I just want to follow up slightly. Uh, I noticed in, in your statement, and I appreciate your concern um, about South America's increasing uh, absorption into China's Belt and Road Initiative. And these tactics of predatory economics provide the pathway for China to hold significant leverage over the region's affairs. Uh, I know that you talked about the funding being restored, but during the time that it was frozen, do you believe that it helped malign actors like Russia and China grow in the region? It certainly uh, provides an additional window for their t to come in and, and work their tactics and techniques. and, and uh, you know, what we hear from partners is that they don't, they want to partner with the U.S. Uh, they want to align with us. And I don't act, actually get into the choosing thing, but we do talk about democracies and values and consistent long-term relationships and respect for human rights and rule of law and those sorts of things that align themselves. And we then expand it beyond the predatory loans to IT that not only has a front door but a back door right into Beijing to uh, illegal fishing and illegal mining mm. and uh, construction of questionable construction and all these sorts of things. And, and the, the clear choice is to partner with the U.S. But in order to do that, we've, we've got to be present. And I think we're, we're at the level, we're back to the level now with uh, the countries, uh, Northern Triangle, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador that allows us to, to continue to commit and, and have them pay back on our security. And just very briefly, could you mention any specific programs that the State Department and USAID have that work especially well to enhance regional security and protect our interests in the Northern Triangle? We mentioned it several times today, the IMET program, international uh, education is key. The foreign military finance FMF program is a State Department program gained at its multi-year gains at security cooperation. That's important. State Department has a GPOI global peace operations uh, uh, program. That, for example, allows the El Salvadorians to deploy to Mali. Okay, I've got one more question, so thank you, and, and we'll follow up on those. Um, I apologize. Um, General O'Shaughnessy, one more question for you. As migration flow at our southern border has decreased, have the number of active duty troops decreased commensurately? Uh, Ma'am, they've been consistent throughout this year, this uh, both uh, calendar and fiscal year, uh, to what the request for assistance had come from the Department of Homeland Security. So you have not decreased the troops, they have not returned to their missions? They, they have not, they've been steady state. Okay, thank you. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Ms. Torres Small. Mr. Kelly, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
Admiral Fowler, um, recently I've been hearing rumors that there's a potential for up to a 20 percent reduction in security cooperation funding within DOD. If true, I'm extremely concerned about the disproportionate impacts these cuts will have in your AOR and also in AFRICOM, some of those places where we do a lot more with less. I'm extremely concerned that I think a large part of that is planned to be taken out of the state partnership program which uh, gives tremendous benefits uh, all across the world and is a low cost, so we cut something that's really effective. Uh, can you talk about the strategic risk that a cut to security cooperation and specifically the state partnership program would have on Southcom? The uh, Defense Wide Review did cut 20 percent from the uh, department's uh, what we call our triple three security cooperation uh, program. Uh, and those cuts have been distributed across the combatant commands. The, the um, FY21 percentage of that cut for Southcom is, is rate added about 20 percent. Um, Southcom has been decreased in that fund 32 percent in the last three years, and, and we've had to make some hard choices on prioritization. And, and prioritization is important, so that um, there's no argument there in terms of prioritization. But our guard teams uh, and um, and your state's guard team uh, partnership with uh, Bolivia is uh, they're key and they fall in on, they're often those guard teams, state partnership teams, are the force providers that go along with the uh, security cooperation fund. So with, with, with just the people without the funds, it really doesn't provide a whole package for some of the engagements. We're looking at how do we restart our relationship for Bolivia, for example, uh, and that will be challenging for us to find the funds to leverage that relationship. I, I would argue that that's great power competition in a long-term investment as we provide a modest amount of investment in a country like Bolivia or Ecuador or Peru that gives us leverage and allows us to train, allows us to be interoperable with our partner, allows them to get after threats that affect us and, and them. Uh, so the drug uh, threat is, is a perfect example. It pays long-term dividends and gives the United States of America positional advantage against future great power moves uh, from China and Russia. Somebody's going to fill the void. One of our chiefs of defense said, uh, when you need a lifeline, a life ring, you're going to take it from anybody. I said, yeah, but careful what the rope around that lifeline does to you. And, and you're right. Uh, we also have a state partnership with Uzbekistan, which has uh, yielded tremendous benefits in CENTCOM's AOR based on a state partnership and a personal relationship that I have that was established long ago through my guard state partnership job. Uh, talking about Bolivia, um, I'm hopeful that we can re-engage, and I know that our Adjutant General is re-engaging, and I think there's some opportunities there to get in on the ground floor and establish relationships that help us carry that, uh, carry that forward. So uh, I hope that we will continue to strengthen the state partnerships uh, in Bolivia and other areas, and also the IMET. We've got to use that. Uh, and I know that you do, but places like Bolivia where we haven't in the past had people in IMET the sooner we get engaged, the sooner we are influencing and making friends with the leaders of 20 or 30 years from now, which is very important. I was just recently in Iraq, and uh, the, uh, the, the Chad was actually a guy I served with in five over there, and we recognized each other, and that goes a long way. So if you would, just briefly, uh, what can we do to strengthen the state partnership program in the Western Hemisphere? And I think uh, the, the things General O'Shaughnessy mentioned where he brings the state partners together, uh, we do the same thing. We bring them together. We talk about what our shared objectives are. How do we reach those shared objectives with a partner? How do we make the best? And pay, for us, a state partnership is our principal force that we send uh, to the, these nations. And so how do we ensure that we're doing that most efficiently? Predictability is important because we've got to be able to tell our partner nations and our state partners a year out that, that you can depend on this month, this time, that we want to be unpredictable to our enemies, but predictable to our partners in the Guard and to our, uh, our nation, partner nation. So stable on-time budgets, uh, the consistent funding level uh, are very, very important as we go forward. And, and just finally, I just want to compliment both of you guys and all our other COCOM commanders. You guys are really engaged with the state partnership program and give good guidance so that we make sure that our guard units from 54 different states and territories are engaged with the right priority, which are DOD's priorities. So I just thank you uh, for what y'all do every day with our state partnership programs. With that, I yield back.
Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, Ms. Escobar, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you to our panelists. Thank you for being here today, and thank you most especially for your service. General O'Shaughnessy, it was wonderful to visit with you yesterday, and I really appreciated our conversation and the time that you took um, and your commitment to ongoing uh, communication, uh, especially with regard to Fort Bliss and El Paso. And my, my questions really are going to center around some of the conversations that we had yesterday. I know NORTHCOM oversees critical missions that help provide for our security, and you and I talked about how important those missions are. That's why one of the things I'm always concerned about is the opportunity cost of tapping military resources. When we apply military resources to legal asylum seekers, we take our eyes off of genuine national security threats. With regard to the latest crisis response force being deployed to the border, including to my community, El Paso, can you indicate what missions they would otherwise be engaged in and how are those losses made up? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, first, I, I would highlight that uh, this force that we're talking about, approximately 160 uh, of which 80 went to uh, California and 80 went um, to, uh, to Texas, um, that force is actually assigned to us uh, for this uh, particular mission set. Um, this is actually an opportunity to highlight the great work we do with the Department of Homeland Security, uh, realizing that, to your point, that this force is really for a different purpose. Um, and they allowed us to keep that force at home at Fort Polk uh, in order to maximize the readiness for that force. They were able to train together. They were able to stay at home with their families until they were actually needed for, in this case, what they were seeing as an increased demand signal as a result of the Ninth Circuit uh, court decision. Um, and so it, in some ways that was a positive because they have, since October, they've been on this mission set, but they haven't had to deploy to actually go do the mission on the border. Our commitment to DHS was that if they asked for it, though, we would make it available to them. So we did in the timelines that they uh, they were so inclined to do so. But this is a military police force. Uh, this 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 is uh, also includes helicopters and a general purpose uh, force. So uh, we have tried to walk that balance of maintaining the readiness while still contributing to our lead federal agency for securing the border, Department of Homeland Security. I do want to point out that what has been unusual and new and particularly alarming to my community is the sight of military uh, personnel with guns at our ports of entry. Ports of entry that are um, utilized every single day by tens of thousands of people in a community that is binational, bicultural, truly international, a community really that sees itself as one region. And um, we see our ports of entry as um, symbols of unity and symbols of friendship and familial ties as well, and economic ties. And the the um, while this this may be you know part of the umbrella of work, having seen this just happen recently has been jarring to to many members of my community. How long do you expect the crisis response force to be engaged at our ports of entry in this way? Uh, Ma'am, I would say first, uh, I want to send uh, kudos to our teammates in this, our Department of Homeland Security brethren, our, our Custom Border Protection. They do a phenomenal uh, uh, effort every day uh, across not only the ports, but across the border uh, at, at large. Um, specifically to this particular deployment, um, it, it, will, it will last as long as uh, Customs and, and Border Protection feel that they need to have this capability there. Uh, I, so I can't give a specific answer. It's not tasks. It, it's actually on... Uh, call, if you will, for the remaining of the fiscal year. I don't believe it will be deployed for that long. Uh, I suspect uh, over time, in coordination with Department of Homeland Security, they will relieve us of that particular mission set. I would also note that they're, they're not the primary responders. They, they're there as a backup for our, for our lead federal agency in, in doing this mission. I understand that. Um, it still is really jarring to have families who have been used to seeing our ports of entry um, in a very positive light suddenly see uh, military enforcement on, on 
on these ports. Are they, uh, what are the specific duties? Are you, do you know what the specific duties are for the folks that are actually on the ports of entry? And I'm running out of time, so if you wouldn't mind just being as uh, succinct. Very quickly, and this uh, that may, might actually help. Uh, the, first, we transport the, the DHS members, the CBP members to the right place. Second, uh, we provide uh, the engineering capability to move obstacles if they need to move obstacles very quickly. And only third, in a tertiary role, do we have our military police that could be uh, employed. Thank you so much, General. I, I just want to reiterate for the public that um, the Congress has funded the Department of Homeland Security, um, two supplementals, hundreds of millions of dollars, um, and I believe they are well equipped to, to do the job. Thank you so much. Really appreciate all of you. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Escobar. Uh, Mr. Gallagher, you're recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, Secretary Rapuano, um, I want to thank you for your consistent engagement with the Cyberspace Solarium Commission. Thank you for mentioning the work of the report uh, in your testimony uh, and the concept of layered cyber deterrence. We are, as you mentioned, uh, releasing our findings today. Uh, for those who are interested or perhaps having trouble sleeping, uh, this is the final report. You can get a copy from all of us for the literal tens of people watching on C-SPAN right now. This is the report right here. Uh, but we do hope that we can spark a debate and your work was um, essential to the final product. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to, because so much of our final strategic recommendation involves building upon the progress that's been made within DOD around Defend Forward, could you briefly sort of describe the genesis of Defend Forward and the steps you've taken to implement that as part of DOD's overall cyber and national defense strategy? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Congressman Gallagher. Defend Forward is, is really about preempting, deterring, defeating malevolent cyber activity targeting the United States. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to be forward. You have to be understanding how adversaries are operating, what tools they're using, what, what uh, techniques they're applying. So that is, that is really the driving uh, emphasis of our strategy in terms of where we were several years ago and where we are today. And then a lot of what we talked about in the course of the Commission's work was, you know, in some sense, the difference between deterrence and cyber and strategic nuclear deterrence in the Cold War is that there was little margin for error and for failure in the latter, but we start from a position of sort of constant failure, particularly below the threshold for military force and cyber, and therefore we need to build in a certain level of resilience in the face of failure. Do you think with that in mind, and when we talk about homeland defense, let's say there's a significant cyber attack, uh, would it make sense to have some sort of continuity of the economy plan in place with accompanying legal authorities to be more resilient and be able to recover uh, quickly in the, uh, in the case of such a massive cyber attack? So I, th I think what you're getting at is identifying the most critical infrastructure functions that may be vulnerable to cyber, identifying them as such, and applying specific measures of effectiveness and, and the applications of security that should be applied to those systems, and thinking through what rapid reconstitution would, would be required uh, if there were successful attacks against these most critical elements uh, of the nation's economy and other vital functions. Thinking through the unthinkable and being ready prior to a crisis to potentially mitigate the effects of a Correct. crisis. Um, and then finally, I just would say one of the, the recommendations that may not get as much attention is this idea that we've talked about at the subcommittee level of having the Cyber Mission Force do a force structure assessment. Those of us who deal with the Navy argue about you know, the Navy's force structure assessment or lack thereof sometimes. Similarly, the Cyber Mission Force was designed based on outdated requirements from 2013. And so we are sort of asking you and General Noxoni and others to do some analysis and tell us, given everything that's changed in the interim and the threat landscape in cyber, what is the appropriate force structure for cyber? Is that something that makes sense to you? So Secretary Esper has already tasked that to be done, uh, an assessment for cyber operating forces, uh, you know, looking back at what drove the original numbers, where we are today, the very significant dramatic changes in terms of the threat environment as well as in the capabilities and authorities of, of the Department of Defense and, and other agencies uh, as well. And what, what is that, uh, how well do we understand what types of capabilities, expertise, 
uh, need to be represented in that for, force. So that's being done as, as we speak. Well, fantastic. And again, thank you for your engagement with the Commission. Thank you for your leadership. And again, and a shameless plug to the Commission's work. Uh, it's also available, shocker, online, uh, solarium.gov, for those who would like to read the final work of the Commission. We hope this will, if nothing else, spark a debate about the status quo in cyber. And uh, I think all of your testimonies have shown how important this new domain of geopolitical competition that is cyber is. So thank you, gentlemen, for all of your service. Appreciate thank it. And you. I yield back. Mr. Gallagher, would you like to submit those for the record? That is a great idea. Can I submit these for the record? I ask unanimous consent to include uh, into the record all member statements and extraneous material, including the Cyberspace Solarium Commission reports. Without objection, so ordered. Ms. Lurie, you're, you're recognized. Thank you. And um, I'd like to follow up on my colleague, Mr. Burns, uh, comments about the LCS deployment. Uh, to Southcom, and over the course of these hearings last year, I specifically asked each geographic combatant commander uh, about the presence that they have received in their region versus what they have requested through the GFM process. And um, it's good to hear that we've increased exponentially from zero to one um, this year, but I wanted to focus back on uh, the importance of that deployment to the Southcom region, and you mentioned FON Ops, so Freedom of Navigation Ops, Partnership Missions, um, Counter Narcotics Operations. And just for a moment, I'd like to focus on the capability of the LCS as a platform, um, as a suitable platform for those types of missions in the Southcom AOR. Um, and as a caveat, the reason I mentioned that is because in other hearings with the Navy, um, there's been discussion of decommissioning the first four ships of the class um, as early as 12 years in their, in their life. So can you comment on how effective that platform is for missions in areas such as Southcom? It's a very effective platform. It's versatile has a large flight deck. Uh, the uh, variants uh, that we've deployed, uh, we've sent with unmanned uh, fire scout capability as well as manned helicopter. That really exponentially in improves the uh, ability to uh, search out the ISR um, over time. The uh, mission capability, the large internal uh, reconfigurable spaces are important for the full range of mission sets. We've, uh, we've been up to Mayport, Florida and visited some. I've taken my Marine Forces South uh, commander with me. Lots of potential there for Marines uh, to, to go afloat with a flexible uh, maneuverable ability so we can partner as a naval force uh, with our, our partners uh, and in exercises as well as the mission sets uh, that you, uh, you mentioned. So would you include in the utility of that platform also the four ships, the first four ships of the class? Um, we are looking at decommissioning ships well beyond the end of their service life, yet it sounds like the, the baseline capabilities of these ships would be useful within Southcom for the missions that you're accomplishing. And, and broadly, um, ma'am, I'd, I'd say numbers do matter. There's a, there's a value to capacity and the capability it brings. I, the, I know the Navy's challenged with the budget numbers and readiness, and I know there's been some challenges with these lead ships of the class on readiness. I don't, I don't think I'm in a position uh, from the readiness trade-off and cost to comment on the utility of those first four, but I would say that broadly we don't have enough platforms. Right, so I was going to say presence is important, and presence in the Southcom AOR, you've reiterated numerous times how important that is um, to our allies and to the other actors within the region. And so um, I've frequently discussed uh, the OFRP or the Optimized Fleet Response Plan um, and how that is not generating as much presence as I believe the Navy's capability has. So if I'm taking it, you would prefer to see more presence generated um, than purely surge capability from the vessels that the Navy currently has, not even talking about upcoming shipbuilding. Well, you stated it uh, well and, and better than I. Zero is, is equal zero in any math equation or it's infinity unsolvable. So we have to be present in some levels to compete. And so that persistent presence is important in addition to the presence that we might provide from an exercise. And so it does take numbers of ships to do that. I think that uh, the OFRP readiness model is capable of generating the right readiness for that presence. Uh, not all the ships have to be, in my view, to go to South America, um, in Latin America, the Caribbean, ready for every warfare mission. They have to be safe to steam. They have to be able to protect themselves. And they also have to be able to partner and do the counter-narcotics mission set. And so I think we can look at this um, globally and, and put the right presence at the right time, and ships are one of our critical gaps. And you also mentioned earlier the MMSV, the multi-mission support vessel. And can you talk a little bit more about that construct and what other types of somewhat out of the box uh, type combinations of vessels, whether they be contract, MSC operated, um, Navy or Coast Guard that could provide 
further capabilities that are really specific to your region, and that essentially done at, at a lower cost um, than our high-end ships such as DDGs or cruisers. Well, thanks to uh, filling unfunded uh, priority, this innovative multi-mission uh, vessel uh, is um, is making a, a huge difference, uh, and uh, we're, we've put it in as an unfunded for next year at 18 million for the uh, the request. And I think it's game changer. So you're basically saying 18 million is making a big difference. That's 18 million funding for the entire year for the ship, for the multi-mission vessel. I would also just uh, be remiss if I didn't talk about how much more the Coast Guard's doing. They sign up for four uh, force packages a year, and they're currently supplying eight. And so the Coast Guard is, is punching well above its weight uh, in this uh, AOR. So it's great to see the Coast Guard uh, providing that um, capacity. And I know we don't have a lot of time left, but I'd like to think uh, further about the MSC platforms um, and specifically how we could leverage those types of platforms for exactly the mission that you're talking about. So I'd like to have an opportunity to continue that conversation later. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Luria. Mr. Walsh, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, thank you all for... Uh, for everything that you do, and, and Admiral, thank you for, for your time uh, this week. So I just want to, again, shift back to some of the great power competition that we're seeing in our own backyard. Uh, I'm not very sanguine about it at all. I think we need, as this committee and as leaders, need to be ringing the alarm bells uh, to the American people who I don't know fully appreciate the level of what's going on uh, just to our south and, frankly, across, across the United States. So while I fully support the, the national uh, defense strategy, I'm not so sure about the apportionment that we're seeing in this budget, as you heard a number of members mention. I mean, this committee will literally authorize hundreds of billions of dollars of, buy, of buying more stuff, a lot of stuff, uh, a lot of it focused on the Taiwan scenario, and I fully support that. Uh, but as we've all mentioned, security assistance is great power competition. Uh, partnering with our partners is great power competition. The, uh, the state partnership program, Florida's partner is Venezuela, is great power uh, competition. So while we're kind of you know, shoulder to shoulder or, or force to force, uh, wargaming out the Indo-Pacific, we have the termites eating up our foundation right in our backyard. And I find that incredibly, incredibly concerning. Uh, so first question for you, Admiral. Can you tell us more uh, about China and Russia, boots on the ground in Venezuela? It's mentioned in your testimony, advisors. Are those uniformed Russian military that are on the ground in Venezuela advising the Maduro regime? We have Cubans in the thousands, Russians in the hundreds, uh, Chinese in lesser amounts. Uh, these China, uh, Russians range from contractors working on air defense systems, working on uh, helicopters, working on SU-30s, to uh, special force, uh, the highest end special forces that are present. Uh, Spetsnaz. Yes, sir. That's right. Uh, more broadly, I'd like to expand the Russian presence in the AOR. We saw a record number of Russian uh, ship deployments this year. Uh, the the uh, cable survey, cable cutting ships uh, currently on station doing their work here. Uh, Russian uh, high-end frigate that has a cruise missile, nuclear capable cruise missile that came around and, and with several other ships came into NORTHCOM's AOR. Uh, late last year we had Russian bombers fly into Venezuela, so Russians uh, have also invested in a training center in Nicaragua. Would you say that the Monroe Doctrine is at, at risk? Well, I think the Russians uh, see the value of their access, presence, and influence uh, here in the hemisphere, as well as the Chinese. You mentioned the, the Chinese. Uh, yeah, we've been asking ourselves the question, Ambassador Maines fought the hard fart, fight as ambassador in El Salvador. You know, why would the Russians, or the Chinese, excuse me, try to lock up 75% um, of the coast of El Salvador in a 99-year lease? Now, they were thwarted, but they're still at it. Why is China trying to buy a deep water port in Jamaica and why has China built a road across Jamaica, which they have a 50-year lease to collect all the tolls on that road? It's not a very good deal. I think in addition, I was just down in Panama uh, with uh, Representative Rogers and, uh, and Representative Scalise. I think the American people need to understand the Chinese own the Panama Canal now. They own the ports on both sides. 
uh, and they're putting the ports they don't own out of business. And we have had frigates that cannot stop and get the repairs they need because the Chinese ownership, backed ownership, have said no. Do you find that concerning? And, and you know, obviously a part of our con plans, our contingency plans, to be able to shift our fleets from east to west or vice versa. And if the Chinese own the Panama Canal, built by Americans, does that concern you as a military commander? Our most significant exercise every year is the defense of the Panama Canal exercise. And as you noted, uh, uh, should we be back in? Pa Sorry, Admiral, I'm just very short. On it. Should we be back in Panama? I think American so. boots on the ground. I think it's a uh, something we should approach carefully with the government of Panama. The new government is very aligned with U.S. interest and is looking to reverse some of the Chinese influence. And we should approach carefully uh, what the best access is there. Uh, it is a strategic location, and we need to stay engaged there. Je uh, General, just in my time remaining, my understanding uh, in, the, in the Bahamas, the Chinese are very aggressively moving into the Bahamas, 50 miles off the coast of the United States, uh, and buying shipping or fishing rights when we have one of our most sophisticated underwater uh, testing facilities there that test all of our, 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 our submarines, our unmanned vehicles. What are we doing in terms of the Chinese uh, influence in the Bahamas? And uh, as I'm short of time, I'll just uh, broadly say that uh, we are concerned about the Chinese influence there, both from the commercial investment uh, in resorts that then re uh, replace influence. Autec is the, the particular place you're referring to. We have sensitive uh, operations there that we want to keep uh, sensitive and, and be able to do what we, what we do there without intrusion from the Chinese. Uh, so yes, we are concerned, and I think sometimes we forget um, that uh, it's General, miles off our coast. Your Can I take the rest expired. of that for the I record? I request that you... Uh, Thank Take you. this conversation for the record, and uh, Mr. Garamundi, you're recognized. I, I almost want to yield you another five minutes. You're onto something very important, Mr. Waltz. Um, every answer to your question was, we're concerned. That is totally unsatisfactory. Yeah, we're concerned too, but what are you doing about it? With the Chinese, our, our best efforts are to stay engaged through education, exercise security cooperation. One of our main well, maneuver We've already forces. heard that the security cooperation money is being taken out of the appropriations and out of the budget. We had that discussion earlier. Uh, the point here is, yeah, we're concerned. But at the same time, we're not providing the resources that that concern can actually result in action. And there's much, much more. Nobody here has yet asked about the infamous border wall ripoff. $11 billion. $1.1 billion, $1.4 billion or $2 billion taken from the National Guard across the United States, all of them, for their equipment. Mr. Rapuano, is that creating a national security problem within the borders of the United States when the National Guard doesn't have its equipment? The, the answer is yes, okay? Is it yes or no? The decision was it was a prioritization process made to by the Secretary what? of Defense. To build a border wall. To meet, that, a, to meet direction from the President to address a homeland security okay. challenge that so the Department was not the President's not decision. To what is your own. view? My, my, my view is that DHS is supporting the enforcement of laws on the border, legislated by Congress, okay. and is overwhelmed in terms of its capacity by the numbers crossing illegally. That is a lot of, that's just not factual. You know that's not factual. So don't, don't give us that, all right? That, that is that, factual. Uh, then delivered to me the facts, not alternate facts, delivered to us the facts, okay? When will you have that, those facts in my office? We, we can provide you all the information upon which we based our response to DHS request When will you have it in my assistance. office? We'll, we'll provide you copies. When? Of, when? Yeah, tomorrow. No, not tomorrow, but... Uh, but when? Next Don't week. dance with me. When will next you deliver week, those facts? I think facts? we can do that. When? By Wednesday of next week. Very good. I'll expect it. You'll have it. $11 billion 
taken out of the Department of Defense activities all across this world, including within the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, New York, New Mexico, critical national projects that were determined by the Department of Defense in this committee and the Senate, military construction projects. So when are those going to be built? Presumably they were important. They, they will be funded in the years ahead. They were deemed to be not as critical in terms of funding now. Okay, I'd like to see the analysis of that criti criticality. We would, will you deliver that to my office next Wednesday also? Why the border wall of which uh, on the construction projects, 3.8 billion was taken out of those military construction projects across the world. Less than 900 million has been obligated that money. 2.9 billion dollars has been set sitting unspent for the last year. Are you aware of that? It's a fact. That's 2.9 billion dollars of critical military construction projects that have not been built, but that money is sitting unspent, unobligated, somewhere in the Department of Defense or the Treasury or OMB or somewhere. Can you explain why? It is more important that that money be unspent, sitting unspent, rather than those construction projects, including the European Defense Initiative programs, not going forward, that were deemed to be critical in pushing back against Russia's aggression. Can you explain that to me? I'll pass your request to the comptroller. No, this is a policy question. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Congressman, I don't, I don't have the status of all those the funding elements in terms of uh, your it understanding is a fact that they're frozen. That $2.9 billion is sitting unspent and unobligated. Apparently, I'm out of time, but I'm not out of questions. You have been participating in a monumental. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Bacon. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Appreciate all three of you being here. It's great to see General Shaughnessy again, who I served with off and on in my Air Force uh, career. So great to see you here. My first question is uh, to Admiral uh, Fowler. I appreciate hearing your, your, uh, the information you've been sharing on Russia and China's investment. So I won't go down that path, but that was where I wanted to go as well. Uh, but could you tell us a little bit the status of Chile right now? I know a few months back there was a lot of violence and uh, demonstrations there, and, and they're a good ally. So. I was concerned. Thank you. Well, they are a good ally, as you mentioned, uh, and they are an exporter of security. As we speak, a Chilean frigate is deploying with a U.S. Navy aircraft carrier strike group to the Asia Pacific, and this is a demonstration of the Chileans' commitment to uh, global security, not just hemispheric security, and it's a, a, a demonstration of the Chileans' high-end capability. Uh, there's a lot to learn from working with them. Last year, we partnered with Chile and hosted UNITAS Pacific in, in uh, Chile, the, the nation, in fact, the world's longest serving maritime uh, exercise, and, and Chileans led that exercise, and they led it capably. Uh, that we're working uh, to do additional partnerships with the Chileans in cyber and in the land domain, and so uh, we continue to have a strong relation. Earl, earlier this uh, year, unfortunately, they lost a C-130. Uh, we've we surged some assets to try to help them do the search and rescue, but it was in the horrible uh, conditions of the, of the uh, Antarctic. Um, closely looking at the instability, um, we're very pleased to work with our partners that have remained professional. Is it starting, to, is it starting to calm down? Well, I, I think we haven't taken our eye on, the, okay. on the, off that ball, but uh, we're in constant dialogue and sharing intelligence with them and, and helping them. There was recently a report, too, of some violence in Colombia where the rebels used to operate. Are we still in a good uh, position there in Colombia? Um, or are they, are they doing all right with, their, with the peace agreement that they have? I, I would, um, sir, I'd fight along the Colombians any day of the week. They're fighters, they're professional, uh, they have tough security challenges that they've overcome. Plan Colombia was a success. It was a long-term right. uh, investment. They invested $10 for every dollar that uh, other nations invested. They've got a lot of challenges. Uh, so they've got terrorists. The recent reports of that, were they just one off, or was that just, or is it hopefully not a reoccurrence? Well, we're, we're again, we're watching that okay. closely. They have 
close to two million migrants in their country. They're dealing with uh, FARC dissidents. They're dealing <coughs> with uh, narco traffic, narco terrorism, and, and a significant uh, challenge there. Um, the, they're, they're working all these challenges and they're continuing to export security. Last year, they trained uh, 1,500 special force units in Central America uh, to help them get after their fight while still working their security challenges at home. So it's our, uh, a top priority for us right. working with Columbia. I flew with the uh, Colombian Air Force about a half dozen times, extraordinarily professional. I was impressed. <laughs> Charles Shaughnessy, uh, you talked a little bit about our ability to detect ICBMs, and we have some capacity to interdict them. And you also mentioned it's much harder on the cruise with the cruise missiles and uh, the hypersonic weapons, and that we need new capabilities there. What, how does your budget request, how does it get towards this problem? What, what things are we trying to invest in to detect uh, the, these new threats? Yeah, first, uh, if you indulge me for one second, I'll reminisce back to our time in service together. And thank you for your great work in the United States Air Force and then continuing to serve uh, in Congress and then on this committee to continue to influence uh, national security. Specific to your question, this is, a, this is a very difficult challenge we're faced with going forward. One of the ways that we're really trying to get after it is uh, working with industry, uh, instead of just going after a particular widget and saying, we need a widget to do this, to do this one mission set, we're actually going with industry and saying, here's our challenge. We need domain awareness. We need to understand what's happening from undersea to space. We need the ability to command and control that, and then we need those defeat mechanisms in a holistic system. And by really talking to industry and collaborating with industry, we see what's in the realm of the possible. And so we've actually had some success there, and then we're taking that into the budget process, because instead of asking like traditionally we do within the DOD is asking for a partic particular system, we're actually looking for a system of systems. And so how do we bring that into the acquisition process? Uh, we've had some su success this year of really focusing on home end defense, and that's why this year, 2020, is a year of home end defense, because we now have that traction. Now it's time to turn that into actual results so we can defend our nation. Thank you very much. I yield back. Mr. Crow. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you to all the witnesses and your continued service to the country and your testimony today. Uh, I understand that the FY20 counter drug funding has been put on hold uh, and may be cut up to $90 million to pay for U.S. Army Corps operating costs to execute border wall construction for FY19 projects. Uh, Admiral, are any of your counter drug or drug interdiction projects impacted by this hold? Uh, there was a delay in uh, flowing counter narcotics funding uh, that, that money is now flowing. Uh, so to date, we've had no uh, impact to what was programmed for the FY20 uh, level for our counter narcotics funding. How long was that delay? It was, uh, it was uh, several months into the year before that money uh, started to flow. So the you uncertainty really impacted our ability to do the, the kind of long-term management that we needed to, but we worked through it and now the money's flowing. Do you anticipate any cuts for your FY20 plan projects? There has been discussions about uh, cuts. You mentioned uh, a figure. Um, to date, we haven't received any cuts and uh, our, our accounts are, uh, we, we've got a good plan, uh, spend plan based on the, uh, the current amount uh, for the rest of the year. And if there are any reductions in FY21, how will that impact your region? This money is about one, about one third of all our funds for uh, Southcom or counter narcotics money. They're critical uh, for the security of the United States of America. They're saving lives. So uh, reductions in funds are going to be something that we're not going to do, uh, and that is going to result in uh, some uh, narco trafficker that's not taken off the battlefield. Uh, and, and for all the witnesses, uh, are any of you anticipating have you, or have you been ordered to create plans or in the process of planning for uh, additional deployments to the southern border? Not, not beyond the current support that's, uh, that's being provided. So as of today, there, there is no planning uh, for additional troop level increases to the southern border? Not as of today, no. No plan, sir. Okay. Uh, shifting gears uh, just briefly uh, on the issue of Arctic uh, uh, control and the increased pressures in the Arctic, there are plans to increase the number of our icebreakers. Uh, you know, there have been appropriations for um, you know, both the planning and the start the construction for those icebreakers. So, uh, General O'Shaughnessy, starting with you, um, are the current plans sufficient? Uh, in your view, over the next five years, the field, the icebreakers that are necessary to counter both Russian and Chinese uh, influence in the Arctic region? 
Well, first, I would applaud the effort of the U.S. Coast Guard and, and the U.S. Navy that has supported uh, that procurement of the icebreakers. Uh, I've, I've actually been on the Polar Star, our, our uh, icebreaker that, that is, uh, you know, 44 or so years old. Uh, we, we need these icebreakers, and they need the polar security cutters now. I would also say that as the deployment happens, six, normally six of them, at least three heavy, uh, initial deployments likely to Antarctica. And so we, we have to look not just at the first one that will uh, be operational, but when is the second and third one going to be operational, which we'll need in the Arctic uh, as well. So so from my perspective, I'm very pleased that we are making progress in this. Uh, we had uh, significant funds this year, over $500 million applied to it, but we need to continue that program. And if anything, we ought to be looking to accelerate it. So the, the six, as we understand it, uh, would that be sufficient in the long term? Because I know Russia has upwards of 20. Uh, clearly, it's a start. Um, I, I, my, uh, as we work closely with the Coast Guard, um, this, especially with the three heavy uh, as a minimum, uh, potentially up to six heavy, depending on how they end up doing the procurement, uh, will give us a start. But this, this is, uh, we see diminishing uh, sea ice, more navigation actually increases the need for those icebreakers uh, in order to uh, take advantage of the Arctic. And Admiral, could you just very briefly classify for me, as we talk about the, the pivot to great power competition, a lot of people view that solely as an Indo-Pacific pivot, but could you just paint the picture for us as to the Chinese investments uh, in, in Central and South America and how you believe that fits in with their overall strategy? Yeah, it's, it's clearly a global uh, view uh, for that great power competition. It's playing right out here in our neighborhood, the significant increase in foreign direct investment in loans, uh, China's number one uh, uh, creditor, uh, the Chinese trade. I think by the end of this year, we'll see that China is the number one trading partner with the whole hemisphere. And as as I've emphasized, our presence with small units like Joint Task Force Bravo, which is 685 uh, soldier sailors, Marines, airmen, that's our main maneuver force along with our state partner. That's that's key to anchoring our positional advantage in this hemisphere. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you, and I think that concludes our, our questions from members of the committee. Um, Mr. Thornberry and I would uh, both like to thank you very much for your participation today and for, for answering these valuable questions that will provide insights into the process as we move forward for the, the NDAA, and uh, thank you again. The hearing is adjourned.